Hello, and today we're going to go over the basics of body tissues, an overview of the four types, and their embryological origin. And I've talked before about the different layers that make up your body wall and the organs within your body. Each of these different layers are made up of a different kind of biological fabric, which serves particular functions. But these biological fabrics are complex and take some time to understand. So I'm going to show you an analogy using a man-made object to give you the general idea of what I'm talking about here. So this image is showing a breakdown of a breathable raincoat. Each of the four layers contribute to the overall properties of this jacket. The outside layer repels raindrops. The next layer makes the jacket breathable, probably with some kind of wicking action to release water vapor that would otherwise make you all sweaty inside. Then there is the layer which keeps in body heat, and then the most inside layer that is touching your skin. So if you're wearing this jacket inside out, or if the insulation layer was against your skin, maybe it's rough. So all the layers with their specific properties are in a specific location. And if we want to decide to look into what gives the material the property, we're going to see the structure of the fabric allows small water vapors to escape, but those pores are too small to allow larger raindrops to pass through. So that's the structure, and then if we were interested in the material makeup of any layer, we could break it down to see the particular polymers involved in giving that fabric some of its properties. So looking at these man-made objects, we could be pretty comfortable in thinking we understand how the structure and material are appropriate for the function. Maybe because metal, glass, wire, rubber, cloth is relatively simple. The material that makes up biological entities, such as ourselves, is not so straightforward. We are made of cells. Our bodies are made up of tiny, specialized building blocks, trillions of them, and the things that those cells produce. Of course, there are in our inorganic components, the major one being water, but everything you see on the human body are either cells or cell products and the structures which they create. The cells are not visible with the naked eye. You could only see the net effect. So looking at this top patch of skin on the arm, you can't see any cells here. And in this close-up, you see the individual hair and the ridges in the skin, but those are not cells yet. In this electron micrograph, you'll begin to see that top layer of cells. These are actually dead cells, but this is the scale we're talking about here. And that's the top surface you're looking at, but if you were to take a cross-section of that layer of skin, you would see something like this stack of cells that is covering your body and separating the rest of your body from the environment. That is indeed the function of that layer, and this is what that fabric looks like. But if you were to look at the muscles in a similar way, do you think they would look like this? Will the cells that make up your brain look like this? If you look deep inside your bones, would they look something like this? Are the bones even made of cells? You're going to be examining all these tissue types, and we will find out in the exciting world of histology. So cells in a group are going to combine to form tissues. And those individual cells will have special properties and they're going to combine with each other and the surroundings in a very specific way. An important point here, it is not just the cells, but the extra cellular material produced by those cells, which will contribute more or less to the properties of that tissue. So those factors just mentioned are going to define the four main types of tissue, as well as all the subtypes of tissue. And we're going to go into detail about epithelial and connective tissue in the next two lectures because they are part of every single system and organ we cover. So that's where tissues sit in the levels of organization. And for this video, we're going to answer these types of questions, the definition, their general function, and where they came from. Once again, histology is a big part of this class, and that's the study of tissue. 
So a tissue is defined as specialized cells and their cell products working together in groups to carry out a specific function. And these cells are going to be connected within that tissue to other cells or the surroundings with intercellular material. And that material may be holding the cells tightly together or the cells may be widely spaced apart. Whatever space is between cells, there's always some sort of interstitial fluid around the cells. Living cells require some sort of aqueous environment for gases and other materials to diffuse through. So one other thing that defines a particular tissue is its embryonic origin. That is, where in the very early embryo did these cells originate from? So mostly we're going to focus on groups of cells rather than individual cells, although the properties and structures of individual cells will be discussed in context of the properties of the tissue overall. So there's a couple things to keep in mind when we're thinking about our biological fabric. First, the cell membrane acts as a selectively permeable barrier that allows some easy passage for some things like gas and more controlled passages of other things into and out of the cell. This is going to become particularly important as we talk about the functions of the different epithelia. And so I'm going to talk more about selective permeability and the general concepts of secretion and absorption in the next lecture. And the second thing is that although the lining of the membrane is just a soft phospholipid bilayer, the cells themselves can have a fairly rigid structure for their size. The proteins embedded in the cell membrane, as well as the protein filaments that make up the cytoskeleton, are the reasons the cells are not just this floppy bag of water. Perhaps more importantly, the cells are not just floating in water. Their extracellular matrix also provides a wide range of possible consistency, from very watery to very solid. So this is going to become a very important factor when we talk about connective tissue, where it's all about the extracellular matrix. So those are the cells and their environment, and we're made of living cells. I want to take a second and remind you of what a cell needs to survive. A single cell, like this cartoon amoeba living in a pond, this single cell survives on its own and does so by exchanging gases and nutrients and waste through the cell membrane. I'll stress again that oxygen and glucose and the like need to diffuse through an aqueous medium to reach and pass through the cell membrane. So in this simple yet multicellular organism, you could see all the cells in this case are still interacting directly with an aqueous medium to exchange material. So that's just one thing to remember about the cells in your body. They're still living things and they need a particular environment to survive. And then here's a little more detailed image. And you see the cells facing the outside world are specialized to deal with the outside world protective barbs or sensory neurons to detect stimuli. The cells that are inside the lining of this creature are specialized to take in and digest the concentrated fluid within its little cavity there. And those two layers might be held together by some sort of biological glue between them. There also appears to be some sort of muscular layer of cells which is going to help the animal move. That cell that detects stimuli may pass that signal on to other internally located cells to control those muscles. So you have an outside sheet of cells covering the entire animal and then you have an inside sheet of cells lining that cavity and in the middle you have a substance that connects the two. And you also have other internally located cells which cause movement and cells based on external stimuli are going to help direct that movement. So you could see what I'm getting at here. Mm. Well, you have all four tissue types observed here in a very simple layout. And if you didn't understand anything I was saying, that's okay. But we're going to see all these types of tissues in the human body in a much more complex organization. So here are the four main tissue types and their simple one word that starts with a C description of their function here. So the four main tissue types are epithelial which covers things, 
connective tissue, which connects things, muscle tissue, which contracts, and the nervous system, which conducts electrical signals. The muscular and nervous are pretty straightforward to understand, and we'll talk about them in detail when we get to those systems. But briefly, muscle tissue is specialized to contract and either exert a pulling or squeezing force. And we'll go into detail on skeletal muscle and later discuss heart and smooth muscle as we get to them. Nervous tissue is specialized to respond to physical and chemical stimuli and change that stimuli into electrical impulses. Cells in the nervous system pick up signals from the environment and ultimately pass those impulses on to other neurons or muscles and glands. The next tissue is connective tissue, which is the most varied and widespread of the tissues, ranging from everything from blood to bone. And you'll learn why these are grouped under the same category in the upcoming lectures. And the last tissue is epithelia, which we'll discuss in the second part of this lecture because like connective tissue, we're gonna encounter it in histology in some form or another throughout the entire semester. So those are the four main tissues in a very dis simple description of their functions. And the other criteria for defining a tissue is where they came from embryologically, which is what we'll talk about here. So once an egg is fertilized, that single cell will start to divide into two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, then 64, and so on in this exponential fashion. At some point, a special group of cells forms a mass that begins to start the work of forming you. And one of the first main steps is specifying that group of cells into what are called the three primary germ layers. These are sheets of cells that are destined to become particular types of tissues. The outermost cell layer, called the ectoderm, and an innermost layer called the endoderm, and in between them, the mesoderm. So those are the three primary germ layers, and we're going to somehow get four of the main tissue types out of them. Your ectoderm will give rise to neural tissue, so your brain and your spinal cord come from the ectoderm. The mesoderm gives rise to two of the main tissue types, connective tissue and muscle tissue. So now, doing the math, you're thinking, well, the endoderm must give rise to epithelial tissue. And that's kind of true. It does give rise to the epithelial lining of your gut, as well as your respiratory tract. But there's a whole lot more epithelial tissue in your body that is not derived from the endoderm. Your ectoderm also gives rise to the epithelia of your skin, the outermost lining. The mesoderm gives rise to various types of epithelia, such as the lining of your blood vessels and the lining of your serous cavities. So you see epithelial tissue, which is all over the body, is coming from all three of these germ layers. So once these germ layers are committed to a certain fate, those cells start to move around and start to begin to magically take the shape of the early embryo. So that small blue ectoderm-derived tube will become your brain and your spinal cord. And that sheet of cells covering the whole embryo becomes the epithelial layer of your skin. That ventrally located endoderm tube in yellow will go on to form the epithelial lining of your digestive and respiratory tract. Everything else that you see here is derived from the mesoderm. The skeletal muscle is fairly obvious in this picture, and the connective tissue in its many forms makes up the rest. You can make out the bone and the fat maybe, but there is a lot more as well which we'll discuss in the connective tissue lecture. But that common embryonic origin of those connective tissues is one of the reasons that things like bone and blood are in the same tissue category. So these are the three primary germ layers and the tissue that they gave rise to. And next time we'll talk about epithelia. We'll see you then. Bye.